All right, you can be seated now. Oh, wow. Well, that was a uh, thank you so much, Sandy. And um, it is really uh, my honor to be here. I love God's people. It's what I've given my life to do, um, is to minister to God's people. You are his treasure, his pleasure. Each one of you were created out of his heart for something wonderful. And there's a reason that you're born now, right? That you're here now, that you weren't, you know, you weren't here in 1910 or, you know, you weren't here in the Middle Ages. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> but that you're here for this time. And so it is really an honor to be here. It was, uh, we did it kind of the last minute because I was here in town and um, but I just want to say that, you know, I've been in ministry for 30-something um, years, and I, you know, you meet a lot of people, and I do consider this couple my dearest friends, and I consider them, um, it, you know, I know some people don't like the term, but for me personally, she says she calls me, but I call them. They're like, <laughs> even though <clears throat> I'm, I'm, uh, we're, we're fairly close in age, I still consider them a mama and a papa to me. And um, I, I, you, all I have to say is you are a blessed people, honestly. I've seen, met a lot of people, and they are the real deal. They are authentic. What they are in the pulpit is what they are behind the scenes. Um, when I pastored <clears throat> for 14 years, we had them in often. Uh, Mickey would minister uh, in our services. We'd have Sandy in for conferences. And they were the real deal in the pulpit and out of the pulpit. And so I just want to just tell you how blessed you are. I know that this is the Bible Belt, and I told Sandy on my way over here from Dallas, I said, oh, my gosh, this is, you know, in the Northeast, we have a lot of big steeples, you know, old, old churches that are empty, right, because they were from the awakening, right? And there are, we have a lot of Presbyterian churches and a lot of denominational churches, but here you got all kinds of storefronts and wild names and mega things on the highway and get, yeah, I almost ran off the road. I stopped and saw one with the form of a Bible on it and some, it did, it had some like odd name and I'm like, okay, this is dying. We are, we are not, what is it? We are not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> not that I've been in Kansas, but anyway, all things, I just uh, want to say that today that all things are possible in the glory Everything is possible. I think it's so wonderful. Um, you can really feel the pastor's heart that Apostle Mickey has for the people of God because, you know, how many of us grew up in the church or were mentored in churches or surrounded where all you had to do was give and then all your financial problems are gone. And you have a lot of people giving and all their financial problems are not gone because it's what they're doing with the rest of it. And it takes someone with boldness to come out of the hype and the manipulation to really get down to brass taxes and teach you how to prosper and live. Because God cares about that. But we do still, which I know that they know, we still have the opportunity because we are a people of faith. We are a supernatural people that are not conformed to this world. We have an opportunity to live out of the power and the influence of another realm, of a superior realm that is with us all the time that we access by belief. We don't have to manipulate that realm to get that realm to come and manifest itself for us with all kinds of weird stuff, all we have to do is we just walk in faith. It's the simplicity of the gospel. The gospel is simple. The plan that God has for us is simple. And it is, it is really, to me, it has always been getting a word from God, hearing a word from God, believing that word, and watching what God does with that word. And seeing his, his power manifest for his people in supernatural ways. You know, we had uh, 
a, a great testimony. I, I went to visit a, a church in our region um, in New Jersey, and I just went to visit. They're friends of mine, and they're uh, like a, they're a prophetic church, and they're, they will even say, instead of like more of a church, they're actually like a, it's a prophetic gathering. When you go down there, like the, the, the you know, like the, the, the I don't know, the, uh, the guitars are prophesying. The, 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 the walls are prophesying. They all prophesy. It's like amazing. I mean, she had a word for me that, well, I guess I will say this publicly. <laughs> That's not going to make it. I just, you'll know why when I say it. But she had a word for me. She goes, Kathy, I just see you. I just see this picture of Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins, and everywhere you pop into, the glory is going to come. Well, she had no idea that Mary Poppins is my security question in my bank account. <laughs> so, so now if you want to log onto my bank account, just put in Mary Poppins, and maybe you'll, you'll get whatever's in there. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so because it's the atmosphere. See, we create atmospheres with our faith. It's what are you believing for? Are you coming to church because it's Sunday morning and, oh, Elmer, this is what we got to do. We got to go down there to them freed people, and we got to go worship, and we got to go pay our tithes, and then we got to go have a meal at Denny's, and then we'll go home, watch the football, get up tomorrow morning, and we'll just know that we just serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Instead of coming with an expectation that your worship is stirring, that there is, there is a realm that you can't see with your natural eyes that is being activated all around you. Well, I don't know. I get out in the spirit, and I say I get out in the spirit, not get out in the weird. All right? Just so you could, we're supposed to walk in the spirit, and that's what I want to impart to you today. We have to be a people that know how to walk in the spirit. We're going to find out this morning that your maturity scripturally, biblically, and in reality, your spiritual maturity is gauged not on how many angels have come into your kitchen or how many times you have stayed in prayer for five hours to try to get over in the spirit realm so you could tell everybody that you saw something. Your spiritual maturity, the Bible tells me in Romans 8, is what classifies you. I'm getting way ahead of my notes. Sorry, scripture man. I'm like way beyond what I told you. In, 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 in Romans, oh, I'm sorry. I am, Lord, excuse me. I'm worse than Donald Trump. It must be a Northeast thing. I have names for people. By the end of the day, you will have a name. He, he now is scripture man. Every time I come to town, he will be scripture man. He just comes up to me, what are your scriptures? I'm like, brother, I don't know what my scriptures are, but I'll try to find something. <laughs> but in Romans 8, 14, it says, for many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, most of us think when we read that scripture, and I remember as a, in Bible school, because Brother Hagin used to uh, say that scripture often, but I used to always think about it, wow, I'm a, I, I belong to God, so my inheritance is that I get to be led by the Spirit of God. But really, when you read the Scripture, and when, when you read it, it says, for as many as are the led, the New King James says, for as many as are the led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. These are the weos, the mature sons and daughters of God. What classifies your spiritual maturity is the degree to which the Spirit of God, the voice of the Spirit of God, the power of the Spirit of God, the motivation and the impulses of the Spirit of God is what reigns and dominates your natural life. That's what makes you mature. Not how many angels you've seen. That's great. They, I tell the Lord, you can come. You can bring several. But I don't have to see one to know that I have a relationship with God and that I can flow in power in my life. A matter of fact, I will tell you, I've never seen one. But yet I have seen miracles. And I've seen a demon once. And that was probably enough. I said, God, it, it'll be fine. I'll smell them. I can sense them, but it just, it'll be fine with me if I don't ever have to see that again. But do you see what we have to, my heart right now is, I've had several dreams, and in the dreams, the message of the Lord is to make revival relevant to this generation. 
See, we have to know that there is a, a, an apostolic foundation that the Father gives us, gives his church a, a, to be built on so that we don't get off in squirrely land. We're supposed to be a people that live and move and flow in the spirit of God. Brother Hagen, speaking of him, used to say, as easily as a, as a bird flies in the air and a fish swims in the water. That is how natural it should be for us to move in the supernatural. But we have made it spectacular and sensational, and we, we get people to pay us to see it because we think that makes us more anointed. And I will tell you, too, that there are, there are many in this hour that are operating in occultic spirits because they are pushing in illegal, illegally because they think they need something sensational to draw people to them. If you have Jesus, the word of God says that when Jesus is in you, if he is lifted up, he will draw all men. You know, I was in a, uh, did a, a women's meeting a couple of weeks ago, and after I just got up and preached the word, just preached the word of God. Well, towards the end, you know, now this is the picture generation, you know, God forbid you, you know, you always have to be like ready for when you're going to get photographed and it's going to be everywhere. <clears throat> So they all, some of the young ones, they come up, can we take our picture with you? Well, they, this one girl is, she must have been in her, <clears throat> maybe her mid-20s or some, or close to 30s. She is sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. And I'm thinking, and so all, everybody says to her, what are you crying? She goes, I don't know. I've just been crying. I haven't cried like this in church for 10 years. I don't know what this is. I don't know what, th now, there was nothing wild that happened visibly, but it was the presence of the Holy Spirit right there in the room. Well, I have no idea till the next day when I get a text. Apparently, she was the pastor's daughter that they were sponsoring that event that they had been believing for for years. She got saved that service. I did no altar call. It was just the presence of Jesus in the room. And as far as I know, there could have been angels there, but they didn't necessarily come in and say, hey, I'm the harvest angel, and I'm going to come and get her. <laughs> now, I guess they're there, and we want them. I know they're here today because they, we worship the Father, and they're here. But so we, we need a little bit of that. We need to be snapped back into alignment to really get an understanding of what it means to live and move and breathe in the Holy Spirit. And so back, you think I forgot. I'm blonde, but I'm not that bad. But I went back to my friends in New Jersey. I had no idea, because there's the atmosphere. So apparently, I prophesied to them something about their building. I just said something about their building. So I saw them this week, um, uh, this week at the conference, and she goes, oh, I didn't have a chance to tell you. She said, you came and gave us that word? She said, and the next week, a woman walked into their church and said, look, I got all this money. What's your mortgage? Paid off all the mortgage for their land. See, you can carry. Russia. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. See, with God, all things are possible. It's we have to have a level of expectancy. And so I just had this word drop in my heart. I, I don't want to call it a sermon because I don't know what it is, but this is how I flow. I'm, I'm very spontaneous. That's why scripture man probably thought I was growing a horn out of my head when he asked me for scriptures because I'm like, I'll give them to you, but God only knows if you'll ever turn to them. So, but I'll, I'll try, you know. And then what made it worse, then, then someone asked me for the title. I'm like, oh, Rashamaya. Lord, give me one. I said to, I said to Prophet Asini, wait, hold on. Let's stop talking for a minute. I got to get a title. I got to like think of what a title is. But I think I got a good one. All right. So now see, this is what the Lord does. The Lord will manifest in his joy. You know, and it's like when you were a kid and the doctor said, this isn't going to hurt. And he lied. He, he lied, right? Which is why every time they came, I hid under the bed because they knew they were liars, these doctors. Back then, they made house calls. Back in the day when dinosaurs roamed the earth is when I was a child. But what happens is you get the joy, but you get that, that little bit of Novocaine, right? They spray it. By the time my kids, right, our kids were, and they would get shots, they put that spray on there. Alexa would scream, give me that spray. 
and they would spray it and numb it, but eventually they had to get the injection. So you just, you just go with the spirit and let that joy bubble up inside you, but be ready because when that injector comes, all right? All right, so scripture man, we are doing 2 Kings chapter 2, but he let me know, anno scripture man, I love you. If I don't have a name for you, that means you didn't make an impact on me. So you made an impact on me. That's why you have a name. 2 Kings chapter 2, and I'm going to read out of the Message Bible, which he may not have. But he, do, uh, no, well, okay. All right, so you know what to do. Listen to me. We love you, Scripture Man, but might have to ignore that for now. Now, this is a familiar portion of Scripture that many of us know. I know if you've been in this church around this couple, you know it. It's 2 Kings chapter 2, and it's the story of Elijah and Elisha, right? In the message translation, you ready for the word? I love to read the word because the word has power. So many times, you know, so many times in the church now, we don't want to read the Bible because the, reading the Bible takes too much time and the service has to be only an hour. So if you read all those scriptures, you won't get your message out. Well, we're, we're not that people today. I don't think you're ever that people. You're, you're never that people. But that's what it is. A lot of people don't even bring, you know, of course now they read from their, you know, sometimes from their computers and everything. But the point is, I find the word to be so powerful when it's read. And the translations, I always say, because I'm an Italian, the translations are just the different sauce on the pasta. So I, I, so some scripture, right, pastors, there, some uh, scripture, a certain translation will just hit you and bring revelation. And that's what happened. I was just meditating on this portion of scripture, sitting in a chair the other day, and it just leapt in me. And the Lord said, this is for the freeze. Because I prayed. I don't just, you know, pull something out of my quiver. Oh, this is in my briefcase. I preached to 95 other places, and this works, so I'll do that. I wanted a word for this people. And the Lord gave us one. So just before God took Elijah to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on a walk out of Gilgal. I love the fact that they were just walking. Just walking. It's amazing what could happen when you're just walking with God. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. God has sent me on an errand to Bethel. And Elisha said, not on your life. I'm not letting you out of my sight. So they both went to Bethel. And the guild of prophets at Bethel met Elisha and said, Did you know that God is going to take your master away from you today? Yes, he said, I know it, but keep it quiet. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. God has sent me on an errand to Jericho. Elisha said, Not on your life. I'm not letting you out of your, my sight. So they both went to Jericho. And the guild of prophets at Jericho came to Elisha and said, Did you know that God is going to take your master away from you today? Yes, he said, I know it, but keep it quiet. Then Elisha said to Elisha, Stay here. God has sent me on an errand to the Jordan. And Elisha said, Not on your life. I'm not letting you out of my sight. One other translation reads, I refuse to abandon you. And so the two of them went on their way together. Meanwhile, 50 men from the guild of the prophets gathered some distance away while the two of them stood at the Jordan. And Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and hit the water with it. The river divided, and the two men walked through on dry land. When they reached the other side, Elijah said to Elijah, Elisha, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Ask anything. Now, before I continue reading, I want to say this. Most of the time when I have heard this, this chapter taught, it is always in or often uh, related to the anointing or passing of mantle from a man or a woman of God to the next generation or to another person. But I really believe that that is certainly applicable, but what is an even greater revelation to me is how this speaks of how Jesus, how Jesus transferred his mantle, released his mantle on his people. 
when he rose from the dead. How the spirit of God was poured out. And it's very interesting that you see a pattern here of three times, almost correlating between how Peter and had Jesus had that conversation with Peter three times. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Three times we have this engagement about how much you're going to follow Jesus. How close you are going to stay. So he says to Elisha, what can I do for you before I'm taking from you? Ask anything. That to me just demonstrates the magnanimous heart of the father. Anything. And Elisha said, listen to this. This is in the message. Your life repeated in my life. I want to be a holy man just like you. Isn't that our desire with the Lord? Hasn't that been, I could see your faces, how many of you have said that to the Lord, Lord, the one thing I want, you know, in our humility and, uh, and our affection and devotion to Jesus, have said, Lord, I just want to be like you. I just want to be like you. I want to act like you. I want to love like you, right? I know. How many of you prayed? I know. I could tell. This is the kind of people that pray those prayers. And this is what Elijah says. That's a hard one. But if you're watching when I'm taken from you, you'll get what you asked for, but only if you're watching. So basically what he says to him, if you do not watch, you will not have your double portion. And so the word that the Lord's given me to give to this body is it is a season for you to watch in the spirit. It is a season for you to watch and observe the movement of the spirit in each of your lives personally and even more so corporately. And so he says, and so it happened they were walking along and talking, and suddenly a chariot and horses of fire came between them, and Elijah went up, and a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it all and shouted, My father, my father, you the chariot and cal cavalry of Israel. When he could no longer see anything, he grabbed his robe and ripped it to pieces. Then he picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him, returned to the shore of the Jordan, and stood there. He took Elijah's cloak, all that was left of Elijah. <laughs> this is what Jesus left us, the anointing. He left us the person who has legal right in the earth. He left us the person that is going to die demonstrate him to humanity in the earth and hit the river with it saying now where is the God of Elijah where is he and when he struck the water the river divided and Elisha walked through and the guild of prophets from Jericho saw the whole thing from where they were standing and they said the spirit of Elijah Elijah lives in Elisha, and they welcomed and they honored him. The spirit, listen to what that translation says, the spirit of Elijah lives in Elisha. We see a type and shadow of what happened at the resurrection when the Holy Spirit was poured out on all of us who believe. That now, Remember, his cry was, I want to be like you. And the prophet saw that he was in him. Now, that word is nuach in the Hebrew. It is the word to come rest upon or to come rest in, to abide. But this is how in the Old Testament that, that they were empowered. But the word that the Lord uh, really highlighted to me was this word about watching being a watchful people. You know, when I talked to you before about maturity, there was a, this was a moment where the maturity of Elisha was going to be manifested, who he was, and that is what the earth is groaning for. It's groaning for the manifestation of what? The weos, 
Now, some of you that don't know what weos is, it's not a, it's not like hummus, weos. It's, it's weos. It's the Hebrew, the, the, the word that is used to describe a grown son of God that now had the right to run his father's business. Not only had the right to run his father's business, in the Hebrew culture, it was a major thing. That's why Jesus was 30 before he received the Holy Spirit coming on him. There is this maturing process that, and see, we in the church, and especially in this generation, we cry out more, 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 more. Can I tell you something? God is not going to give you more until you're able to handle more. He is a good father. You can, you can sit in every revival meeting and you could cry out more. But what is, what, is, what is going on in you? How are you maturing? How are you developing? And how you develop and mature as a believer is, is the moving and the working of the person of the Holy Spirit in you and yielding to that, to bear fruit, to he's the one that speaks to you what you're to do with your future, what you're to give, where you're to worship, who you're to marry, all those things that are so much a part of our practical lives. And the Father has given us, the Holy Spirit is the one. He's the one that comes and helps us like, like Esther, right? Like Esther had, he, what is it, Haggai, Heggy or whatever his name is. <laughs> she, he had him and he was the one that helped groom her and guided her in the process of anointing and soaking in those oils and preparing herself for her moment. See, there is right now in the church for, uh, for a while now, we, have, we know a lot of stuff in theory. We have so much teaching, so much available. You have YouTube, you have live stream, you have CDs, MP3s. You can, you can, you, your head can twirl off like the exorcist with so much stuff that you got to keep up with. Right, with all the stuff that's out there, all the teaching, we have so much available to us. We know a lot of things in theory, but what the Holy Spirit is saying, it is now time to move from theory to practice. We are going to be able, if we are watching for it, this isn't, see, so many times we think being a watchman or being a person that watchful, oh, that, that's for those intercessor people that lock themselves in their closet and they say they're watchmen and they're watching and they see visions and then they pray and they fix everything in the world and, and we all can survive. No, you are all, Jesus said, we are all to watch. Jesus said that, that word is Gregorio, where he said we are to watch. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said we are to watch. You are to watch and pray. This is what he, uh, this is what he said in, um, where's that scripture here? Oh, this is what, it, what he said. I love the passion uh, in Matthew 26. Jesus needed them when he was in the garden. He needed them to be awake and to pray. And he says to them, could you not watch one hour? That is the Greek word Gregorio. We get the name Gregory. It is the word to guard, to awaken. He needed them to be awakened. To be alert, to be watchful for what was happening around them. And we are in a generation where the enemy is working overtime to lull you to sleep. It is, a, it is, a, it is an age of distraction. It is an age of distraction. He is luring us. Many times it's through disappointment. Your, your spirit man is not awake and watchful. It, it's not, yes, there's the part of it that we are to be watch. We, the Bible tells us that we are to be aware of what the enemy's doing, and that's important. But more importantly, what I want to minister to you is that Elisha was standing there, not abandoning Elijah and walking close to him, walking close to him so that he wouldn't miss what's coming. Because what's coming was a double portion to empower him to do what he couldn't do before he saw it happen. And if you're asleep and you're not alert and you're lulled and you're not, your spirit man is not active and awakened, you will not see what is coming. 
It's watching out for the degree of glory that is now coming in this season. And it's not just for the services. It's for your personal life. It's for your prodigals to come back home. It's for your, the, your promotion in your jobs this past season. I've seen so many believers begin, just begin to walk into new areas, take steps of faith into new opportunities of employment. How many people I know, many of the young ones, I mentor that all many of them have gotten up and just heard the word of the Lord and moved and a lot of them to Texas she must have something here it's true but you understand what I'm saying how did they know to do that they were aware they could feel the movement of the Holy Ghost they could sense what was happening around them so we have to be a people that pay attention and the enemy is distracting many of you. He's distracting you with what you haven't seen come to pass that you've been waiting for. Disappointment is a distraction. We don't realize, many of us, the degree to which we've become hopeless and faithless on the inside. One of the, the greatest operations of the enemy in this generation is escapism. We, we, we turn, look, I watch TV, just so someone thinks, oh, she's probably one of those people that doesn't watch TV. I, uh, I watch TV, I have Netflix, I have Amazon Prime, probably I watch stuff you are not interested in. I, I've been watching this great documentary on the pilgrims, it's like amazing. It is really amazing. You should like how they found this. It was like amazing that dude that came over here in the Mayflower, what he had. You know, he was the first one, the first apostolic people. He got the revelation as a young man, the scripture that says, if two or more of you are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of you, and stood and said, what the heck is all this going on with all this hierarchy? And I can't hear from God unless I go to the Anglican church and I, with all those people with robes on or whatever. He started a movement because he got a revelation out of a scripture. We think the apostolic movement is that the, the pilgrims knew the apostolic movement. That's why they moved over here. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we binge. The, the new word in the culture is binge watch. You sit there for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, and you go to another place, wherever that place might be. Some of, some, the, I, I find with it, they watch these they prison breakers, some kind of prison shows. I don't know, uh, the, the new black or orange or whatever the heck it is on Netflix. And they watch these shows with these women in prison. Why would you want it? No, okay, well, Kathy, just behave yourself. <laughs> the point is, you're escaping. And then you come to church and think the pastor's going to be like bippity boppity boo and, and put a wand on you and all your problems are going to go away. You know what? I, the, the, the offices, the, the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, they're like for me, I liken them to my trainer at the gym. I still got to be the one to do to do that lunge and hold that weight. And, and there's some times where, you know, and it's this, this body that's up in his 50s now, it starts to tilt over. And there's got to be someone standing there to make sure I don't fall down. And she'll go up. She'll just touch my back a little bit and put me back in position. When you come here on Sunday to worship or when you come here midweek to worship and you hear the word, that is the word of the Lord coming out of the prophetess and the apostle to just give you a little touch to make sure you don't come, you don't, you don't get out of alignment and that you are strengthened, that you're strong. They give you wisdom. They give you advice. But they can't go home and they can't go to your job and raise your children and manage your bank account and know what you're to do with your life. You've got God himself inside of you that's able to do that. That. And what are you doing to foster that relationship? What are you, are you awake? The lethargy must come off us, the hopelessness. We can't be conformed to this world. Do you want to live your life through a TV show? Ooh. Hours and hours and hours? Or it could be anything you're doing. 
And all of that is fine, but we are in a season. What I am here to proclaim to you is you need to know the time and the season that we are in. And God is moving. It is the time where the mantle is splitting the waters. And if we are watching, we can receive what's coming. And it's good. And it will empower you to live. When you're in, in college, the first several years, right, Sandy, you're a, you, you love school. She's school. She would be a great teacher when she just looks like one, like a really anointed teacher, because she is. But notice that the first couple years, it's all in the textbooks, right? And you master what's in the textbooks. But then when you get in your senior year, you move from theory to practice and a lot of us are theoretical believers are we really believing for something and so it, it, they call it a practicum it's called a practicum it's the time when you step out and give attention to what you've learned so we're getting our practicum we are in the season where we just can't sit back and just, in theory, know a lot of stuff. The Father is requiring us to grow up into we us so that that double portion, he's watching. What are we, what is the Father, though? Father's watching your growth. He's not watching all the do's and the don'ts and the law. He's what you're, what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right. He's number one. He's watching for the, he's watching to see how hot that flame is inside. He's watching to see how you move every day to keep that flame burning bright. What's your devotional life like? What, what it, are you listening to the Lord? Are you just coming to service on Sunday and thinking they're going to tell you everything you need to know? In 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 in the Amplified, the Apostle Paul says, Accordingly then, let us not sleep as the rest do, but let us keep, see, let us not sleep as the rest do. We see all these parables that Jesus told about what it would be like that we are to be a watchful people. It's just not watchmen intercessors. It's you're supposed to be watching. And to watch, we can't be distracted by the darkness. And for some of us, the darkness is a distraction. You know, some of us, I used to be a, um, and I, I still do to a certain extent, but I love the news because I was a political science major in college, and I love the news. I love current events and seeing what's happening, and I pray for the nations and have dreams about the nations. And so I'm always, and it's gotten to the point where I have had to put a guard on my heart because the level of of sorrow I've had to put a guard and watch watch what I watch so that I everyone say watch what I watch what are you watching what are you watching are you able to discern the movement of the spirit in your life when the Holy Spirit when you sit down in that chair with your Bible open and you begin to hear, you know, you, you got to deal with that sister that you have a bad attitude with right now. See, we think that stuff doesn't matter. That's part of the maturation process. See, we all want the anointing, and we want to lay down, and we want to soak and all that stuff, and that, and that is great. Let's see, I'm, Mama's coming here now. Everyone say, listen to Mama. The soaking's great, but if you just get up like a sponge, all soaking wet, but there is no structure in your life. There is no substance to how you are living. That's not the plan of God. But it's like everything, and, and, and I'm sure that they could vouch for this, that the longer for, I see some young faces out there. When, when, when you get our age and you've lived a couple generations, you start to see the same thing, <laughs> the same thing come around. And when God gives us a revelation of something, we have a tendency, as Brother Hagin used to say, to run the car right off the road. We have a hard time just getting that revelation and staying straight on the road. We take something to an extreme all the time. 
But listen to what he says. He says, according then, let us not sleep as the rest do, but let us keep awake. Let us keep, let us keep awake, alert, watchful, cautious, and on guard. And let us be sober, calm, collected, and circumspect. Uh, in the message translation, it says, but friends, you are not in the dark, so how could you be taken off guard by any of this? You are sons of light, daughters of the day. We live under wide open skies and know where we stand. So let's not sleepwalk through life like those others. Let's keep our eyes open and be smart. People sleep at night and get drunk at night, but not us. Oh, should I say that one again? People sleep at night and get drunk at night, but not us. Since we are creatures of the day, let's act like it. Walk out into the daylight, sober, dressed, up in faith, love, and the hope of salvation. Isn't that good? So we need to be prepared for the practicum that we are walking in right now. And what I want to say to you is not some of you are looking at your trials and your tests and the situations, right? You're looking at them as this, this is the devil, the devil, the devil. And, and it is the devil. But what is, what is going to come out on the other side of you overcoming the devil? Because if you really believe that the spirit of God, the greater one, is in you, you are wired. Your DNA is to overcome everything that comes in your path. And there's things that you are going to have to fight for. We've got to get, you know, there is, we do, we live by faith. And I know that sometimes in the church that there's the, the controversy, you know, of, um, of, you know, people that are too much talking about war or the devil and then the other people that don't talk about him at all because we don't even have to give him the time of day. And, you know, you have these two, you do, you have these two different extremes. And if I was a young person in the church today, I'd be like, <laughs> oh, 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 tick tock. Because you hear very anointed people with great unction say very powerful, persuasive things in one direction or another. But I always believe that those two things come in the middle to really give the truth. And the Bible does talk about a spiritual warfare that we are in. The Apostle Paul uses militaristic terms to describe our walk. And you don't have to go looking for the devil because he's looking for you. But if you are walking in the light and you are not walking in the darkness, if you are walking in the glory, if you are walking in the power of the spirit, he is overcome every time. Now, you've got to walk through that process, but you have to have an attitude of victory. You know, uh, uh, Sandy was talking about faith. And I have people say that to me all the time. I'm like, I don't know why they like think I'm, she explained it the best. She always, she's the one who made me understand it. But do you know what faith is? It, it, faith really, w I love language and I love words. And that's why when I study the word of God, I will really dive into the Greek and Hebrew. Not because I want to stand up and impress you because you're totally unimpressed anyway. But, uh, but the reason is because in the mean, meaning of the words, that word for faith in the New Testament is the word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. And it is the word to describe being persuaded of something. You have, to, you have to get in that word. You have to get in the presence of the Lord and allow yourself to be persuaded about something. And most of the time, we find out how persuaded we are about something by what we do. See, faith has it is an action word. If you say, well, I'm believing this is going to happen, then there are, there. how many of you have ever had something happen in your body and you know in the natural you are not well, but you get up and you move and you do things like you're not sick? Where another person would just lay in the bed all day and say, oh, I feel terrible. 
you know, get someone to cook for them that day. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, there's times where, you know, obviously we, we need to help each other in those situations. I don't mean to sound harsh, but what I'm saying is, are you persuaded of some of this or aren't you? Are you persuaded that you're a victor? Are you persuaded that the spirit of the creator of heaven and earth now lives and resides in your body? And every day that you wake up, if you choose to yield to his movement and his thoughts in you, that you could be prosperous, victorious, and live on a whole nother level than the world around you. And it is just walking in it. It's just walking in it. It's learning how to hear the voice of the Spirit, how to cultivate that lifestyle of hearing God. The most important thing that you are going, and I'm telling you, in the days ahead, in the days we live in now, there is so much chaos, so much confusion, and a lot of fear. That's why we're seeing a lot of young people dealing with, well, and older ones too, but a, it shouldn't be young people, should not be so fearful. I don't remember, you know, in my, in, my, in my early 20s, it was like, oh, the world was my oyster. You know, you're young and you're, you're full of passion and you're, you're going to college and, you're, and there's hope. And now it's this, just this heavy, heavy thing and afraid of everything. And it should not be for us as God's people. We have the fearless one in us. See, when we talk about living according to the movement of the Spirit, I am talking about yielding your, your, the negativity of your natural thought life to what God says in his word, to what the Spirit of God inside of you is ministering to you and leading you. We think, you know, I, when I teach people on how to hear the voice of God, you know, we make it so complicated. I say to people all the time, do you remember when you got born again? How did that happen? Someone was talking to you, or you were in a church like this hearing a message, and you had the thought, or, or heard, we could use the word heard, you need to go up there and receive Jesus. You need to pray that prayer. That same voice that you listened to and acted on, and something happened to you that changed your life, that is the same voice every day. We just make it complicated. When I got saved, I was a senior in high school. Homecoming queen, party animal. I was like, it was like crazy town. And this football player broke his leg. And I, he was, he broke his leg because he had, was a believer and disobeyed God about something. And at that time, this was his understanding, and had walked away from God, had gone back to an ungodly lifestyle, and he was, he was a, a football player, but he was also a baseball player. He was an incredible athlete. He right now is on the board of one of the, the most influential churches on the East Coast. He is like on fire for God even till this day. But I was his first victim. And I had a, he had broke his leg playing baseball, and I had to drive him home every single day after I had just smoked pot <laughs> after my accounting class. See, because I was trying to escape. I was trying to escape accounting. Don't even ask me how I got an A in that class. Do not even ask me. But we all were doing it because there always is that anxiety about the future. And I would, every day, I'd have to drive him home, and he'd start talking to me about Jesus. And they were all in Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and then they lied to me, and they told me that girls went to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes meeting, that there were girl athletes there. And so I said, okay, I will go. And when I went there, there was not one girl. <laughs> they were the first lying Christians I ever met. <laughs> But they were doing anything to get me in. And sure enough, I will never forget, they handed me, Apostle Mickey, the four spiritual laws from Campus Crusade for Christ. And I went home, and it said, read the book of John. Well, I got my mother's, oh, no, they, they gave me a Bible. My mother had one, too, a Catholic Bible. But I opened it up, and I found the smallest book of John I could find. And that was First John, because I wanted to go to bed. I read that First John. First John letter was just my speed, couple of paragraphs. 
said that prayer, and I woke up the next morning, and I have never been the same. Now, that is supernatural. That is supernatural. I had no desire for, I had no desire for party, no desire for the drugs. My entire household, revival blew into my home. My brothers, oh, my one brother who was already starting to do more serious drugs, he got saved. My other brother got saved. My mother, who had been a practicing Catholic her entire life, went to one service with us in a non-denominational church, never went back. The whole, we, I experienced revival in my high school. We all had a meet, and we, we, we actually had to go to the Catholic church, and the priest at the Catholic church gave us a big room where all the seniors and the juniors from the high school could gather to study the Bible. I know what it's like to see the Spirit of God move in and change hearts with no marketing, no manipulation, because someone preached the gospel and believed and loved. See, and that is where the harvest is. That soul, that pastor's daughter that is now, that is now a Christian, it was, it was because she felt love. I'm not the only one who has an anointing on me, an anointing in me. So do you. But are you, have you stopped watching? Have you stopped watching for opportunities to release the love of God out of you in your community? Have you stopped? The thing that I want to focus on is it's not, yes, there is the aspect. You need to be aware, just as aware of what the devil is trying to do in your life. Because he does move. But you need to be more aware like Elisha. I will not abandon him. I will not abandon Jesus. I will not abandon his word that he has spoken like Sandy was talking about the promise. I will not abandon that. I will keep, I, mm, 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 I promise, I am looking, I'm looking. I'm not letting you out of my sight, Jesus. I am following you. If you tell me to go to church and I don't feel like I'm going to church, you tell me to go to the prayer meeting, I'm going to the prayer meeting. If you tell me to love my brother when I don't love my brother, I am going to draw from the deep well inside of me and walk in faith and believe that you are going to give me the power to love that brother or sister or my boss or whoever it is. And as you do that day by day by day, that more you are crying for will begin to manifest. And it's not because you earned it. It's, be it's not because you earned it. It's because you've allowed the Holy Spirit to transform you and mature you into a huios. Jesus could have just said to the father, you know, he's at 25, said, you know, I'm done with this carpenter shop here. I am ready for some action. I saw myself in these scriptures. I know who I am. And I would like some greater anointing just about now. But the father waited till he was 30. Just think about that. And I have one more thing. Okay, Lord, help me with this one here. As we're watching. Now, when I teach my Bible school students, I have a Bible school, and I, I love to teach, and I, I love to provoke the students to think and will say something and give them a um, how do I want to, a perspective of scripture of something in scripture it's not that it's not right but to get them thinking about something could it be this I'm not I'm not talking about foundational doctrine but one of the things the Holy Spirit has been I've been thinking about because when God had Adam and Eve in the garden, and you know, I think we will, till Jesus comes back, be unpacking that Genesis chapter. When you think about it, how we think about Adam and Eve, we don't even think of it in time or space. We don't even know how long they actually were in that garden, tending it and eating of those trees. When we read it, don't we think most of the time, oh, God said don't eat the tree, and the next day they went and ate of the tree. We don't, re <laughs> I, uh, I like realize that about myself. I'm like, Kathy, like where did you get that, <laughs> like where did you get that idea? And then, you know, then Satan came, so it was like a, like a, like a two-week event. <laughs> like, we, like, we, like we were so stupid, we messed it up. We had 14 days, and we messed it up and whatever. But we have no idea what really was happening and God said to Adam and see this is the point remember what 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 is the word of the Lord today watch the spirit watch the spirit 
And I'm telling you, I'm saying this because you're going to begin to see him and feel him and notice his movement in your life and in this ministry in a profound way. Because I've never preached this anywhere. This is hot off the Holy Ghost pipeline. <laughs> but now think about this. He tells Adam, this tree, the knowledge of good and evil, you don't eat. All the other trees you can eat from. There's the tree of life. They were moving in some kind of glory realm. Number one to name those animals was amazeballs. All right. They are completely, and, and we know because of what happened when they fell. And th that isn't even an interesting term. They fell like they fell down. No, they, they, I believe they fell out of the spirit realm. And were totally now body conscious. They were totally now conscious of the natural realm. See, there's a way that you can live in the spirit and be totally natural at the same time. Clearly, could, you know, we don't walk around ethereal. But, well, some people do. <laughs> but I want you to think about this. I'm getting somewhere. So he tells him, you can do all this, and this is going to be awesome, but you got to keep the garden. you got to keep it. See, th I'm trying to get you to think each one of you in this room has a responsibility to watch over your own life. You're to watch your own heart. You're to watch your own spiritual development. You are to be alert. That word is shamar. You're to guard it and you're to keep it. To guard it. To be what that word is to watch. In other words, Adam, you got to watch over yourself. Why did he have to? Well, number one, because the Lord knew that there was a snake that was going to come creeping in. Now, when I talk about living in the anointing, and this could be something even we could, we could study further, but those two trees, those trees, I believe, it's not doctrine, Apostle Mickey, <laughs> just getting you to think, could that tree have been a fig tree? That tree, could that tree have been a fig tree? Number one, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil is to be like God. They wanted to be like God was symbolic of partaking of that. That tree was the knowledge of their own self, their own righteousness. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to be like God because I'm going to do this. I want to be like God. It's, it, it was almost like symbolic of the law. The reason I say that, I'm not getting into some big teaching because I want to get to something else. But that's why Jesus, I believe, in Mark chapter 11, cursed that fig tree because I think it was symbolic of that tree of the, of the law. It was symbolic of the law. Symbolic of the law, you will never bear fruit again. And they took the leaves from that tree and covered themselves. Their own self-righteousness, their own works, that we can be right with God, that we can experience God through what we do. And they partook of that tree. They took the leaves from it, and they covered. Like I said, I'm not saying it's the doctrine, but you start thinking about it. The, 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 how Jesus, what Jesus did, talked about that fig tree, that was, that was saying the law, it will never bear fruit again. Because it wasn't, it wasn't fruitful. But I started thinking about the tree of life. Because that tree of life, that tree of life was, was I believe, possibly, not doctrine, because this is how we live. We have to understand that we live by the anointing. Could that tree have been an olive tree? How Jesus was the anointed one. How Jesus, most of his ministry was on the Mount of Olivet. How, and there's, there's, many, there's many things, but that it is the power of the anointing that was it, it, I'm thinking, is it the power of that anointing that came out of the tree? Jesus, the reason I'm bringing this up, you're like, where's she going? He tells them to watch what? In a garden of olive trees. In a garden of olive trees in Gethsemane. That was one of my favorite places in Israel. He tells them, you need to watch and he's doing it in the context of all that grove of olive trees all around him. It's called the press. 
Because what if the, the trials in your life, and I'm sure Sandy probably could teach this better than me, the trials in your life, the pressure of those things, it, we don't realize the degree that when we're walking through them as we stay in faith, the anointing of God begins to ooze out of us. We become anointed. The anointing is released. If we are people that are watching in the spirit, Jesus was watching in the spirit. And so Jesus says to them, he says to them, can't you be awake and couldn't you not watch one hour? I feel like it's almost, uh, Apostle Mickey, a picture of Adam not watching in the garden. He wasn't watching, he wasn't watching what he was eating, he wasn't watching what he was doing, and when he wasn't watching, the snake got in there and at a weak moment, he didn't yield to the spirit. But Jesus, the second Adam, is in the garden with all those olive trees. And he knows that as he prays for that one hour, something must be happening in that one hour that enabled him to take that cup he didn't want. Jesus was tempted just like you. And so he says, wow, I could just feel the anointing on that. This is powerful. He says, do you not, in the Passion Translation, do you lack the strength? See, Sandy talked about strength. To stay awake with me for just an hour. Keep alert, watchful, awake, and pray that you'll be spared from this time of testing. You should have learned by now that your spirit is eager enough, but your humanity is weak. Why, what was trans, what I'm here to say is my belief is that that, that, that tree, was that tree in the garden what sustained man, the anointing, what was produced from the olive tree, the person and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that empowered them and motivated them, that it was what directed their every move. What they part they participated in the anointing. And Jesus said, for one hour, can't you stay awake? It's not about, see, what we've taken it in the church, like everything else we do, we turn it into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to make it a law. I'm going to get up, and I'm going to, you know, pray. And yes, I understand that there's times that we do things that our flesh doesn't want to do in that sense. But what I am believing is that there's going to be released on the body of Christ in this season, and this generation, a passion that drives us to the tree of life, a passion that overrides what the flesh is screaming, but we have to do it, Apostle Mickey, by faith. We have to know that this is God's way. We have to know that even though we want to eat that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and it's just, it's just better to do it that way and easier because we can be in control. But if we just allow the Holy Spirit to start moving and not be fearful, some of you, God's telling you to do things that you are literally afraid to do, but you know that you know that God is all over you, talking to you to do it, but your fear of your natural man, you are eating of the wrong tree, and you might have to be like Jesus and get in there for one hour by faith and say, I am going to pray in other tongues, I am going to pray in the Spirit, and I am going to release the tree of life. I am going to release the anointing in me so that something begins to transpire that I don't understand in my natural man and my friends don't understand. Netflix will not give you this. But we've got to be willing to walk into it. Are you all hearing me? Let's all stand.